Welcome to Life and Faith from the Centre for Public Christianity. I'm Natasha Moore. And I'm Justine Toe. Well, writer Emily Witt once said that she was such a firm believer in the power of romantic love to save and to complete and fulfil her that she described it as a messianic event. And there's no great mystery as to why she'd believe something like that. We live in a culture that through Hollywood movies and the whole mania around marriage and weddings, it tends to enthrone romantic love above all else. The result is that we don't always give friendship its due, which is why it's about time that on Life and Faith, we decided to sing the praises of friendship. So to start with, have you ever heard of Galentine's Day? What's Galentine's Day? Oh, it's only the best day of the year. Every February 13th, my lady friends and I leave our husbands and our boyfriends at home and we just come and kick it breakfast style. Ladies celebrating ladies. It's like Lilith Fair minus the angst. Plus frittatas. February 14th, Valentine's Day, is about romance. But February 13th, Galentine's Day, is about celebrating lady friends. It's wonderful and it should be a national holiday. That's a clip from the American comedy Parks and Recreation, where the super enthusiastic public servant Leslie Nope explains the thinking behind the gathering that she hosts every year for the women in her life. Justine, you've actually held a Galentine's Day event. You had one earlier this year, didn't you? Well, it wasn't quite the event that Leslie Nope held. I just had myself and three girlfriends that I that not, I invited. Not many people can host an event the way Leslie Nope No, can, she has a very high standard of events. No. Basically, I just invited people over because, you know what, I just, I've always thought that it was so sickening that Valentine's Day was dedicated <laughs> to people in love. And I just wanted to just say, you know what, there's other forms of love that we should celebrate and one of them is friendship and you know, sisterly love. So I had my sister there plus two good friends that, you know, otherwise we'd all be sitting around on Valentine's Day just going, great. <laughs> <laughs> Who loves me? You know, so. um, but you, I mean, you're not a marriage hater in any way. No, you're I'm ha- happily married. very happily married. Somebody does love you. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, sure. But I think I feel this way because before I got married, I probably had that Hollywood understanding of love, which is very embarrassing for me to admit. But I hope I'm reasonably intelligent. And I don't think enough people did enough to sort of challenge that. So if that's the case for me, granted, I can be pretty stubborn, but (laughs) if that's the case for me, then I'm sure there are other people out there who similarly will put up romantic love on this pedestal in such a way that other forms of love like friendship kind of fall by the wayside. Um, But what I've noticed as well is that it's not just, you know, naive young girls who have this sort of um, attitude. There's this writer, Ernest Becker, and he says that in a world that's been stripped of God and the transcendent, we look to other things to save us and to complete us. And he says romantic love, what he calls apocalyptic romance, has come to fulfil that category. So I think that does explain why Hollywood is the way that it is. It's interesting that on the other side of the balance sheet, I guess, you have something like the movie Frozen. I know we're all sick of talking about this. I'm (laughs) sure every parent out there is. But it definitely surprised people. It kind of messed with this formulaic love story that we have always seen from Disney. It really shouldn't have been so shocking, right? Like, it seems incredible that every single Disney movie up until Frozen practically has celebrated as its chief event, the sort of uniting of the man and the woman. And yet we get the idea in Frozen that the great love story in this is actually between two sisters and the kind of the guy that she likes is kind of, you know, very secondary to that. So doesn't that just expose how focused we are on one kind of love, romantic love, and we don't really pay attention to the other kinds of love that are equally important, equally fulfilling, like friendship. Frozen still has this messianic love idea, but it's the love between the sisters. I don't think you can have a spoiler alert for a movie as old as Frozen, (laughs) but thinking back to that clip from Parks and Rec, where Leslie celebrates the female friendships in her life, do you think there's a male equivalent to that? Could there be such a thing? You mean like a guy in Tyne's day yeah, sort of thing exactly. where, where guys <laughs> celebrate the guys in their life? Look, I would love to think that it can happen, but I feel at this point that it's not going <laughs> to. And I've got no evidence for that apart from my anecdotal experience of watching Lord of the Rings in the cinema. And, you know, Frodo and Sam are kind of expressing to each other how much they mean to each other, the whole I couldn't have done this without you sort of thing. I wonder if people will ever say... Let's hear about Frodo in the ring. And they'll say, yes, it's one of my favourite stories. Frodo was really courageous, wasn't he, Dad? Yes, my boy. The most famousest of hobbits. And that's saying a lot. 
You've left out one of the chief characters. Samwise the Brave. I want to hear more about Sam. Frodo wouldn't have got far without Sam. Now, Mr. Frodo, you shouldn't make fun. I was being serious. So was I. I just remember sitting in the cinema and the guys behind me were like so uncomfortable shifting, you know, like clearing their throat because the idea of two men expressing affection for each other was just so confronting that they just couldn't handle it. And this bothers me because I think girls are really quite comfortable with having female friendships that can be spoken about in terms of love. But for guys, it's a totally different story. And I have a son now and I would really like for him to be able to have intimate friendships and not have to worry and and only speak about them ironically. Like I know that's how guys relate as well. But, you know, it would be nice to think that they can actually express the, the deep sort of friendship that they have with other people without having to feel awkward about it. I hate the idea that men feel like they can only have um, love for their wives, for example, or love for their partners. And that's the only kind of socially acceptable love that men can experience when that's completely not true. I guess that's bound up in a lot of ways with cultural ideas about masculinity and so on. Uh, There are exceptions though, right? There are. And, you know, I had to look long and hard and think long and hard (laughs) where those exceptions could be found. Um, But I just came across Nick Frost's memoir, um, Nick Frost and I'm sure you know if people have seen uh, Hot Fuzz, great, great film, Shaun of the Dead, etc. So, so these films star Nick Frost and Simon Pegg. And in Nick Frost's memoir, he talks about how he and Simon met for the first time. It turns out they were both interested in the same girl or Nick was interested in her and Simon was dating her. And so he felt really kind of grudging in terms of, oh, I've got to meet this guy and, you know, I like this girl. But it turns out that he and Simon Pegg just absolutely hit it off. And they went out to dinner one night and they were sitting in some sort of diner. And at one point, Simon Pegg just moves kind of a condiment bottle, like a mustard bottle or something, across the table and makes a kind of weird noise or something. (laughs) And in this bizarre, stupid almost instant, it's like Nick Frost understands intuitively that what Simon Pegg is doing is mimicking a scene from Star Wars, you know, (laughs) where Chewie kind of roars at this mouse droid that's, I don't know, somewhere in the Death Star or something like that. And it's such a silly moment, but it really captures for Nick this kind of intense fellow feeling and, oh, I know you. You and I understand each other. (laughs) So he writes about the event. You know, I guess we could argue that we fell in love that day, which sounds, I mean, it has that kind of jokey, bromantic sort of element to it. But there is a real sense that they understood each other and they saw each other and they got it. And this really resonates with what C.S. Lewis talks about in terms of friendship. He says that friendships are born when two people can say to each other, you too, you know, you and I have this common interest. I thought I was the only person who felt like this. And yet it turns out that you understand this as well. How amazing. And then that can actually lay the foundation for a friendship that that can last for a really long time. In um, Simon Pegg and Nick Frost's case, you know, 20 years and counting. If you've just joined us, you're listening to Life and Faith from the Centre for Public Christianity, and we're talking about friendship. Justine, you have just brought up C.S. Lewis. Uh, He wrote quite a bit about friendship, and he talked about uh, friends as being the kinds of people who are looking outward in the same direction. So they're kind of standing next to each other and absorbed in some common interest, whereas he contrasted that to lovers who kind of are facing each other and are preoccupied with each other. Yeah, friendship has this real sense. Um, One of these writers that I've been looking at, Andrew Sullivan, he says that friendship has this ability to let the other person remain safely the other person. So there's a sense of, you know, where um, romantic lovers can be absorbed and obsessed with each other. Friendships can actually mean that you can still preserve your own identity. Um, The fact that you can get lost in the other person, that is part of the glory of romantic love. Um, But it can tend to constrict your world somewhat, we might say. Sexologist Patricia Werikun talks about how when people first get together romantically, they've got a stage called limerence, which is that time when you, you get high off the other person like you might a drug, right? So you're just obsessed with them, you love them so much. But she says that that period lasts two years tops, which, you know, some people might be quite disappointed by, but she says that it allows you to get other things done at the same time, <laughs> which is good. And I think people who have been married um, for, you know, whatever length of time beyond that, that two years of early obsession will tend to say that at the heart of marriage is friendship, you know. So if we acknowledge that, it, does, it doesn't diminish the power of romantic love. It just reminds us that there is 
a power and a depth and an endurance to friendship that we don't often pay attention to. It sounds like you really feel that there's almost a spiritual dimension to friendship. Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, Jesus is the one who said that there's no greater love than, than laying down one's life for one's friends. So the greatest love, in other words, is the love that gives itself for another, which doesn't exclude romantic love, but isn't necessarily limited to it either. We, it can also cover love between family members or with, between friends, between lovers as well. Now, Wesley Hill, he's an American theologian um, and writer who's keenly interested in matters of friendship. He suggests, when reflecting on Jesus' words, that Jesus starts off this revolution in friendship. At the time, friendship was largely understood to be between social equals, so people of similar rank. Um, But this could be quite exclusive, whereas if people were united in Christ, then that could cut across all different social divides. So you had rich people becoming friends with poor people and, you know, starting off this this revolution. Hill says that the way that Jesus reimagines friendship is so explosive, not only because it can cut across those social divides, but because it even potentially imagines enemies to potentially be one's friends as well. So it's like, what Jesus does is he infinitely expands the bounds of friendship so anyone can be your friend and that's why it's it's so amazing and revolutionary. We've actually had Wesley Hill on the program before um, and one question in particular that Simon asked him might be worth revisiting here. Uh, Simon asked Wesley about loneliness and that particularly given the fact that Wesley is gay and celibate. He's committed to Christian sexual ethics that reserve sex only for heterosexual marriage. And this is what he said when Simon asked him about loneliness. I think that a lot of us in the modern world, we have sort of tried to fight back loneliness by emphasizing romance and marriage. And so for those of us who find ourselves unmarried, Uh, it can be a life of loneliness. It can be a life of sort of pining for what you see your friends enjoying while you're kind of left behind, as it were. And I think one of the key things for me to recognize about the Bible, as I began wrestling with with these questions, I I looked at the Bible and I saw that the, the New Testament's answer to loneliness is not marriage primarily. It's the Christian community. And so I've actually found that pursuing friendship, uh, pursuing hospitality and radical community in the church, it doesn't actually solve the problem of loneliness, but it sure makes life a lot less lonely. Uh, Love is something that exists in brotherhood. It exists in friendship. It exists in the the wider network of family and, and community. And we as evangelical Christians, as traditional Christians, have so emphasized marriage that we've forgotten to say, and there are a lot of other ways that people can be called to love. That's Wesley Hill. He's the author of Spiritual Friendship, uh, and that was from our interview with him earlier this year. Uh, He's talking about Christians specifically, but really it's our whole culture that's made this mistake of overemphasizing marriage and romantic love to the cost of other forms of love like friendship. That's right. I mean, it's not just um, Christians who've who've kind of maybe erred here, but everyone really has. Um, I really like what Wesley Hill has to say about community. I think he's really right. You know, when when you're grounded in a community, that establishes a context where everyone can be friends with each other and friendship can include everyone. So, you know, going back to what Jesus was saying earlier, the revolution in friendship that he started made friendship possible with everyone, not not simply people who are like yourself or, or not, not just people who are from your tribe, so to speak. But, you know, if you're single, intimate friendship is there for you in community. If you're married, friendship uh, in a community can also be a way of protecting you from that kind of like bubble of romantic coupledom that people tend to fall into and that I have myself fallen into. Mm -hmm. Um, But when you emerge from that, you know, you want to have broad and deep connections with people as well. So that's the power of community to, to nurture the kinds of friendship that all of us can benefit from. Well, it's great to spend some time thinking specifically about friendship, which gets a pretty raw deal often uh, in our cultural imaginings of love. So thanks for the conversation about this, Justine. Next week on Life and Faith, Simon Smart talks to Trevor Hart from the University of St Andrews about art and faith and imagination. Religion is stifling imagination. It can. It can. It shouldn't. Imagination has always been central too to the ways in which Christians have made sense of the world um, and understood it in terms of, uh, of, of the kingdom of God. And art, of course, has been at the centre of that for many centuries. That's next week on Life and Faith. See you then. Mm-hmm.